For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to the Physics Almanac. In this video, I'm going to cover vectors. Vectors are the mathematical building block of motion and many concepts in physics in general, so it's very important to have a good foundation in vector operations. I've rated the physics level in this video as easiest. So what is a vector? Well, a vector is just another word for an arrow. And arrows have a length, which we call the magnitude, and they point in some direction. So let's draw an arrow, or a vector, that I'm going to call r. We know that r is a vector because of this notation where I've got a little arrow on top of the r. This notation means we're referring to a vector. There are other notations out there. Sometimes you'll see just a bar instead of an arrow. Some books will use bold lettering for vectors and non-bold lettering to refer to regular numbers. And I've even seen some people put the arrow or the bar beneath the letter, although this is less common. Now, what can we say about this arrow? For one, it points in a combination of two directions. It has a component in the horizontal direction, which I'm going to call the X component. And it has a component in the vertical direction, which I'm going to call the Y component. This is in two dimensions. If we were working in three dimensions, there would be a third component pointing in and out of the page, which I might call the Z component. But I'm going to stick to two dimensions because it's simpler, and the rules for the third dimension are exactly the same as the rules for the other two dimensions. This arrow, or vector, also points in some direction, which I'm going to call theta. By convention, we define theta to be a counterclockwise rotation from the positive x direction. If this angle rotates beneath the positive x direction, so clockwise, we define it as a negative angle. Now, as we already mentioned, arrows have a length and a direction. So what is the length or the magnitude of this vector r? Well, here we have a right triangle, and the length of this vector is just the hypotenuse of this triangle. So we can use the Pythagorean theorem to get that the magnitude or the length of r is equal to the square root of rx squared plus ry squared. If we were in three dimensions, you would add plus rz squared under the square root. This notation of placing the vector in absolute value brackets means we're referring to the vector's magnitude, or its length. Alternatively, the length of the vector may also be written by simply writing the vector without the arrow on top. So, with the arrow on top, we're referring to the vector, which has a length and a magnitude. Without the arrow on top, we're just referring to its length. For texts that use bold lettering to refer to vectors, they will often switch to non-bold lettering when referring to the vector's length. Now that we have the length, what about the direction? Well, the direction is the angle at which this vector points. Using the fact that we have a right triangle, the tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, so that will be ry over rx. So to define a vector in two dimensions, you need two numbers. If you were in three dimensions, you would need three numbers. One way you might define a vector is by writing down the x and y components. We can write this vector in what is called vector notation as r vector equals rx times x hat plus ry times y hat, where x hat and y hat are what are called unit vectors. These are vectors that have a length 1. Not 1 centimeter or 1 kilometer or 1 mile, but just 1. They don't have dimensions. Now this is a bit of a strange concept. I think it's easier to think of these unit vectors as simply telling you the direction. So this tells you a length in the x direction. So rx pointing in the x direction plus some length ry pointing in the y direction. This hat notation is reserved to refer to specifically unit vectors. If it's not a unit vector, then we use the regular vector notation. This cannot be simplified any further. You cannot combine an x direction with the y direction. Algebraically, you can think of x hat and y hat as being unlike terms. And I'm sure you know that in algebra, you cannot combine unlike terms. And of course, if we had three dimensions, you would add plus rz times z hat. Now, just a heads up, most books, when referring to unit vectors in the x, y, z direction, don't use x hat, y hat, and z hat. Instead, they use i hat, j hat, and k hat. Personally, I don't understand why they do this. We've already defined the directions x, y, z. Why is it that when we switch to the unit vectors in the x, y, z direction, we're introducing three new letters? To me, that seems to just make things more convoluted. So I prefer to use x hat, y hat, and z hat. But be aware that most books and most professors will use i hat, j hat, and k hat instead. 
So how would we write this with actual numbers? Looking at this triangle, let's use the grid lines as our unit. So the X component covers four grid lines and the Y component covers three grid lines. So we would write this vector as R equals four times X hat, so four in the X direction, plus three times Y hat, three in the Y direction. Another way you might write this vector is by giving its length and its direction. Since this is a three, four, five triangle, the hypotenuse has length five, and the direction we take by taking the tangent, which is gonna be three over four. So to refer to this vector, we would say it has length five and points in the direction tan inverse of three fourths. If this were in three dimensions, you would have to add a second angle referring to a rotation in and out of the page. Now, this way of writing things down is called a polar coordinate system. And this way is called a Cartesian coordinate system. In this video, I'm going to stick to the Cartesian coordinate system. They are both perfectly valid, but this one is a little bit simpler because the polar coordinate system has a couple subtleties you have to worry about, so I'm not going to use it in this video. So far, our discussion of vectors has been fairly abstract, but I think it's often better if you can visualize vectors in the real world. And the way I think is easiest to visualize vectors is by imagining somebody giving me directions on a map. But before we get into that, if you're finding this video helpful, please like and subscribe, and maybe share it with your classmates and friends. So let's say I'm standing at this red dot, and someone is going to give me directions to get to this blue dot. One set of directions they might give me is to move due east some distance rx, and then turn and move due north some distance ry, and that will get me to the blue dot. Another set of directions I might be given is to face due east and rotate by some angle theta towards the north, and then walk in a straight line until I get to the blue dot. Either set of directions is equivalent to this vector r. But these are not the only set of directions I could be given. Someone instead might send me on a meandering path that winds about until it eventually reaches the blue dot. The result of this meandering path is also equivalent to the vector r. Now notice something interesting has happened here. This green path is actually a sequence of separate vectors one after the other. So we have just discovered that we can add vectors. So how do we add vectors? Remember, vectors are just arrows. And the way we add them is to place the arrows head to tail. So let's say we have a vector A and we want to add it to a vector B. And we're going to call the resultant vector C. So C equals A plus B. So what's the rule for addition? We place the two vectors head to tail and then we draw an arrow from the starting point to the end point and this is our resultant vector C. C is a vector like any other vector. It will have X and Y components. Now, assuming we know the components of A and B, what are the components of our new vector C? Let's start off with the X component, which is this horizontal component of C. If we also draw in the X components of A and B, we can see that the X component of C is equal to the X component of A plus the X component of B. And similarly, the Y component of C will equal the Y component of A plus the Y component of B. So the rule for vector addition is you add the components separately. Writing this in vector notation, we get that vector C is equal to AX plus BX times X hat, so in the X direction, plus AY plus BY in the Y direction. Now how about the magnitude and direction of C? The magnitude of C, by the Pythagorean theorem, is going to be the square root of Cx squared plus Cy squared. Well, we just found what Cx and Cy are, so we can just plug that in. And again, if we were working in three dimensions, we would add under the square root plus the square of Az plus Bz. This expression is sometimes referred to as the distance formula, because it gives you the distance from the starting point to the final point. To get the direction of C, we define an angle theta sub C as a counterclockwise rotation from the positive x direction. Now we know that the tangent of this angle is equal to Cy over Cx, so we can again just plug in what Cy and Cx are. And now you know how to add vectors. If we can add vectors, we can also subtract vectors. So taking a look at this expression of C equals A plus B, we can rearrange it to get that A equals C minus B. Now what does it mean to subtract a vector? Well, it means that you run backwards along the arrow. So A, which is the pink vector, is equivalent to running along C and then running backwards along B. 
Algebraically, when you subtract a vector, you just stick a negative sign in front of all of its components. Finally, we can scale vectors, meaning we can change their length while keeping the direction fixed. So let's say we have a vector d, which is equal to 3 times b. We know what b is. To get d, we just add three of them. So we place them head to tail, and the resultant vector d points in the same direction as b, but its length has increased by a factor of 3. More generally, we can scale a vector by any factor q. So q here, which is just a number, scales the vector. Hence, we call it a scalar. The term scalar is just a new name for a number. There is no difference. This scalar can have any value. It does not have to be an integer. It can be less than 1. It can be greater than 1. It can be negative. If it's negative, then it will flip the arrow around. Now, there are a few more operations we can do with vectors, like rotating them and multiplying them, but these operations are slightly more advanced, so I'm not going to cover them in this video. For the purpose of basic kinematics, these are the only operations you're going to need. So now that we know what vectors are, they're just arrows, and we know how to do basic operations with them, we can move on to physical quantities that are represented as vectors, specifically position, velocity, and acceleration. These are the three fundamental quantities of kinematics, and they are all vectors. They have a length, and they point in some direction. So if you found this video helpful and would like to see more kinematics and physics tutorials, please be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified for the release of future physics videos. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.